because we were discussing this a while ago. We were talking about the fact that you really were a pioneer when it came to talking about pop culture in conservative spaces. Thank you. You, uh, Poplitics, started when? 2019. October of 2019 how, was the first episode. How the heck did it take conservative media that long until 2019 to realize that it's important to talk about pop culture and celebrities? Because everybody think everybody's like so highbrow, they all think they're better than it. So when I first launched politics and the first like promo videos came out and stuff, all of these people in the conservative movement were roasting me. They were like, this is so retarded. Like, this is so embarrassing. And why would we do this? This is yeah. not conservative, you know? And I was like, I don't know what you're talking about, but I knew there was a huge market for young women that wanted to talk pop culture. Yeah. And um, because my friends and I, like we're conservative, but we still care about talking about like, you know, Taylor Swift news or Selena Gomez or whatever. So I was like, well, that there is a market for that. I don't understand why we're just giving this this whole sphere over to the left because TMZ, People, E! News, all of these outlets all report pop culture news through a left wing purity filter. Like I remember, I think it was 2019. That's when Miley Cyrus was licking the abortion is healthcare cake and all that yeah. and every outlet covered it favorably like the only people that were not covering it favorably were you know like ben shapiro or whatever roasting her but that's the thing is like he's not a fan of her also criticizing her so i think it hits different mm. whereas like i like miley cyrus i enjoy miley cyrus but like i'm gonna be critical of that sure. so it was just i was like why is there no one on the right that i trust to to cover this that shares my yeah. thoughts that answers my next question which was do you believe that conservatives underestimate the power of pop culture for society of course yes what's scary to me about it is they understand that culture matters culture beyond just policy no Very they say few... it they don't actually believe it yeah. it's lip service but they a lot of times like it's it, very few of the discussions you end up having in these spaces are very rarely about policy a lot of it ends up becoming about social issues which are even closer to pop culture than actual politics are right like you end up it's a it's a it's a very short walk yeah. from talking about miley cyrus and talking about abortion uh and an abortion cake to talking about some government uh some state government uh talking about abortion laws in their state and they wonder where the public support comes from it it comes from the people in the pop culture space the musicians the yeah. actors the movies that push these narratives yeah but see the, the conservative right doesn't understand that a lot of times those issues that you're talking about those are the things that young people are not going to click on they don't care they're not going to click on a video about that but what they will click on a video about is about you know kylie jenner and timothy chalamet and so you talk about politics through that like use pop culture as your bridge to bring them onto deeper subjects i mean i remember when like all the blm stuff was going on in 2020 that's what i was doing i would report on what some celebrity said about it to then get into the you know to the deeper aspect of like, who is Black Lives Matter as an organization? Why are they so corrupt? No, they would have like w not clicked on that otherwise. But I always start conversations by, you know, throw the celebrities under the bridge, get them interested and then be like, oh, and by the way, here's yeah. how I feel about what they said. That's why we were joking that politics walked so that we could run. <laughs> like without <laughs> politics existing, I don't think that pop culture crisis, this show would exist. So kudos to turning point i guess for giving you the free reign to do that oh and i mean turning point they were just so like when i so i was in pop pop radio before for almost a decade and so i was i was doing morning shows in different mm -hmm. markets but it was getting so contentious behind the scenes as a conservative i was always getting in trouble for things <laughs> i would say on the air and my bosses were like you cannot talk about being conservative can you give me an example of one of those times okay so there's a few juicy things one is I said I was an NRA member and a mother who was listening in the car with her kids called the government, the Federal Communications Commission, and said there is a woman who is a danger to society on the air. Children should not be allowed to listen to her because I had casually mentioned very quickly. It was like three seconds. I just said, well, I'm an NRA member and blah, blah, blah. And she said I was a danger to society, <laughs> which anytime that a radio personality gets um, reported to the FCC, like your lawyers have to get involved. It's this huge thing to see if you really violated a law on air. It's very like intense and serious. And I was right. like, OK, well, this is not setting a good precedent for me being 
conservative. I'm not going to deal with this for the rest of my life. Was it also a problem behind the scenes, like with the people you worked with? Yes. Okay. So it was a huge problem behind the scenes. One of the biggest last straws for me was my boss um, had asked me to host a, like a trans girls night what? and oh all what this mean? gay stuff like people that had transitioned or whatever it was like party for them or something and i said i absolutely am not doing this um so that was like a huge argument because we were getting paid like whoever the company was you know hosting this thing they paid to have <clears throat> radio talent from this radio station host it so they have a paying advertiser that wants this <clears throat> product which is me and I, I refused to do it and then um, my boss asked us to sponsor the women's march and that was another thing that I said I'm not doing this and they said well why this is about human rights it's not political so I pulled up the women's march official website that showed that they were uh, you know for gun control open borders abortion rights all of these I said this is clearly political everything about the women's march is political I refuse to do this so that was a huge fight so it was just it was more and more after Trump got elected the the tensions were rising and I, and it was like before cancel culture was a term I knew that I would be fired because I refused to do so many of this stuff um and so at that time Turning Point reached out to me. They actually DM me on Instagram and said, hey, like, we love following you. Keep up the good work as like a young conservative personality online or whatever. And I was like, hey, while I have you here, what do you think about this idea to do a pop culture show from a conservative perspective? And they're like, well, we'll fly you out to Phoenix. You can pitch your idea to Charlie Kirk. So I did. And at the time, Turning Point USA didn't have daily shows. They didn't do any of the stuff like production wise that we do now and so they they liked the idea i said i want to call it politics pop culture politics mesh together i want the colors to be pink and orange i said i want to call my followers cute conservatives like i had this whole vision of really talking to a young female audience and they were like well we'll try it we'll see if it works and i had you know one shot and within i mean the show had been out mm -hmm. a few weeks and like facebook groups were popping up for it and all this and i was like okay i i, I knew it. i knew there was an audience for this yeah and I, that's how i it was like born. that since then you've also expanded outside of just talking about pop culture too like now you're hosting discussions on the spillover which is newer than politics where you cover things like parenting and birth control and true crime even other things interest that audience that you've captured too. Yeah, I think everything I've done has just been the primary goal of entertaining and educating women. Yeah. But mm -hmm. doing it and covering topics that the rest of the conservative movement doesn't really, they think they're too highbrow for it. Yeah, I think you and Ali Beth Stuckey uh, specifically come to mind with like people who've expanded uh, the, the, the discussions that they're willing to host. Oh, uh, yeah. With a, a f mainly female audience. I like Allie a lot. Allie and I talk to Allie out of every, all the females in the conservative movement. She's like the only one I regularly text and talk to. Like mm -hmm. I get along with her the best for sure. Yeah. I also think it's important because if you if we are going to talk politics for a minute is that right now the Republican Party, if you're a conservative and you're voting Republican, they have trouble reaching the female demographic. They did in the last election. They're they're possibly going to again oh it's so bad it's they they need to continue to grow uh, a female audience beyond just what the what the left would portray as like women who vote the way their husbands vote. i just that's their, huge... that's their that's their straw man that the women vote the way their husband votes we know that that's not true but we're saying they need to reach people who are less who are more in the middle and don't really know necessarily all of what they believe but don't need to uh, they don't need to allow mainstream press to formulate everyone's opinion on everything they deserve you should just have to look for people who are uh who have a similar mindset to you you want to look for people who haven't made up their mind yet and yeah. you could offer them a unique perspective before the rest of the world and before the less the rest of the far left or left-wing media gets their you know their hooks in them with their very very specific point of view well you know they just had that um survey or study or whatever that just came out they conducted it between august and september of this year they interviewed like i don't know 1500 young men and women uh and it was like 18 to 25 years old or whatever and did you see that how like yep. all the high school boys were turning conservative and all of the yeah. the girls graduating were going more left and i charlie kirk just had me on his show last week to talk about this and he, him and i vehemently disagreed he was very annoyed with my stance which was i think we have to one do the reverse of like we've been hard you know 
harping on this like facts don't care about your feelings and I said that doesn't work with women you have to actually care about feelings first or make them think that you do so you have to be like super compassionate like I understand that you care about this and I do too and that's why I feel this you have to start all of your debates that way or they will not listen he hated that because he's like well that's a waste of time I mean Charlie is very to the point well, it makes sense he's a man yeah he wouldn't think that way he doesn't think the way he's like this seems like a waste of my time so you're telling me I have to like I have to pretend like I, I care about stuff I don't it's care about politi- I was like well it's what politicians do that's true it's exactly I'm saying like you have to you have to be able to meet them on the same playing field yeah I was like, these women are so highly emotional and and the right has been so obsessed with this facts don't care about your feelings, but it only works with young men. It doesn't work with the women. Women have always been more liberal than men and voted for the Democrat Party more than men, but it's never been the situation where the same age group is going in opposite directions like that. Throughout history, at least in the last century, the young cohort was going left to right mostly together and i think the internet is what polarized them like that because the men are going to find the spaces on the internet that that cater to them and the women are going to find the spaces that also cater to them yeah that's that's a huge problem they're not going to listen to anyone outside of that and it's why it's why dating and dating talk has become so contentious with people because my point that i always make i say what when you watch these videos now of women complaining about men and men complaining about women these are conversations you would normally have in your same sex friend group meaning like if you're if you're guys you're talking with your bros about the things that annoy you about women or the things that bug you in a relationship women do the same thing right guys maybe less so like i don't know if guys are like sitting there talking about it but they'll mention something that annoys them right but women will actually sit down and vent to each other and complain about these things the problem is now everyone's seeing these spaces together so a conversation that was once supposed to be had amongst a close group of friends that you have developed a relationship with is now being seen by everyone and has made everything a more polarized environment Uh, and that's not really good either I think that uh, what we're learning is that unfortunately that contentious media sells Uh, And it's very hard to pull in new people with contentious ideas. Men will be drawn to the idea of facts don't care about your feelings because it's something that's, it works with their brain. That's how, that is how my mind works when when I'm looking at those types of issues, right? Like, but I get why. And a very, very small minority of women will resonate with that, but not the majority. But I also understand the social utility of making an idea palatable to somebody who may not necessarily always see it that way. And a good way to introduce that is to give them other things. There is no, like the view exists for a reason. It's for middle-aged wives uh, who stay at home to sit there and be fed propaganda by Joe Bayar and Whoopi (laughs) Goldberg, Yeah. right? And there is nothing, uh, and and that's also partially because the right would take on principle and say, we don't want to uh, necessarily brainwash someone we want to lead them to the right ideas what they're you know what they believe is the right idea yeah but you need to reach out yeah you well it's all out. like the battle of the sexes now like mm-hmm. that's the whole thing is like the genders at war that's the new thing like we had the race war like yeah. before <laughs> we're like, cycling through no literally like 2020 <laughs> right like that was the whole thing is everything was about race now i feel like more than ever and it probably is all on purpose um because of roe and stuff going into the next election cycle is now it's all like men versus women i think a lot of it is also that it's so profitable that you know, like when you anytime you're talking about these arguments you're talking about it in a, one of a couple places on social media where it's monetized on YouTube, where it's monetized, on all of these platforms where you are incentivized to create stuff that's divisive to make money. So whether it's actually like that in the real world, I think it is to an extent, but I think as long as you're living digitally, it's always going to look worse than it could possibly be because it's just so financially beneficial to do so. Since you touched on dating, (laughs) let me just uh, steer the conversation in a little bit of a different direction. Because before you walked in today, I was getting extremely invested in a reality show oh God. that you were on back in 2016 called Coupled on Fox. Yes. And it only lasted for one season, but you were on that season. And look, I was rooting for you. I want to hear about your experience. Like, how did you end up on that show? What was your takeaway from it? You were the youngest person on it as well. I feel like you were kind of singled out for that reason. Oh, yeah. What was that like? I remember like doing that show. There was a girl from New York City and I was so young and naive and just had barely been in the real world at that time. And I, there was a girl on the show that like lived in Manhattan. I was like, wow, you live in New York City? <laughs> like I was so Indiana because um, that's where I'm from. And I, let me let me guess, the producers love that. 
Oh, loved it. So I got the most air, like, uh, Cameron time out of anybody because I was just so weird, bizarre. Also, they actually casted me, I think, thinking I was going to be the villain because I was... I, it was like my character on the show was the Republican girl. Oh, so the okay. producers and everybody, they were told like make Alex the villain, but everybody liked me <laughs> so for the most part. So it didn't end up really working, but I ended up getting the most screen time, which was really fun. And it was like, yeah, nobody really knows at this point that I did a reality show, but <laughs> I did this show. And I mean, my experience was great. It was a once in a lifetime thing. I had no access to the out, outside world for over five weeks. So no phone, never that's called nice. home, no books, no music, no news. Like it, what? It they was, torture people for that. That's torture. Well, was, yeah, so we've weird. been talking about these reality show stars that come back from it and say like I was being tortured. They were feeding us alcohol and but like, trying to. <laughs> that's like the experience. I don't know. I enjoy it. Like I'm, I don't know that I would do a reality show again, but I'm so glad I did it to understand like what that's like. It's such a cool thing to get to do once. And and it was um we were they took us to this island of anguilla and it was like nothing was there and i remember they like shipped in chicken nuggets for me because at the time i was such a picky eater and i didn't eat healthy at all and they shipped in a huge silver platter of chick chicken nuggets because i <laughs> it was like my birthday while i was on the show like that was neat um but i was the crier <laughs> i cried on every episode they want that they, they want, want that, that. Um, but yeah, it, it, and there was, of course, what's interesting is everybody says, well, are reality TV shows scripted and fake? It's not that they're scripted and fake. Nobody told me what to say or do, but what they do do, do do, what they do is they will chop off part of your sentence so that the full context of what you were saying isn't there. Sure. So let me tell you one of the most viral moments at the time, like, um, I think Vine and stuff was still around. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know, actually. Maybe that's wrong. I don't yeah. remember if Vine was, was Vine still 2016. Around. Okay, well, there was a clip of me that went viral because um, I had said... Uh, I think I, I'm looking at it right now. Is it that I'll be 100% bangable 100% of the time? It says, <laughs> coupled star, Alex Clark. I'm a virgin and my 100% bangable quote was taken out of context. Yeah. So there was I a don't part, doubt it. There was a part of the show where I look straight at the camera and I go, I will be 100% bangable 100% of the time. What they cut out, <laughs> what they cut out is that I said, once I'm married, I will be 100% bangable 100% of the time. And I was so embarrassed that they did that because then yeah it just looked like i was like whoring out on the show which wasn't i was the, the only girl me and one other girl there's one other girl that was waiting until she was married me and her the only girls on the show that demanded to have our own room and not sleep with the guy that we had been coupled uh. with like so I could not have been more I'm like... I'm surprised they honored that request, to be honest. I know. <laughs> but they did. and But like none of that made the show. And so that's the stuff that's Amazing. fake or frustrating. But for the most part, it was a good experience. All right. And <laughs> so from did, there... Uh, but yeah. did you feel like a genuine connection with that guy? Or is it all kind of for the cameras? Um... I think I was trying. You didn't end up with the guy. No, I didn't end up with the anybody. Ending for everyone. I didn't end up with anybody. I, I walked away like the, the finale is me being um, this is sounds fake, but real. The finale is me standing on a deserted island and waving away as he flies away in a helicopter <laughs> and I don't go with him. So, yep. um, yeah, I was like, this isn't going to work out. He was like a single dad, liberal Chicago. I was like, absolutely not. Like I knew okay. like we weren't a match, um, but it was fun. It was go. a good time. Thanks for watching. Listen to full episodes of Pop Culture Crisis on Spotify. Keep up with us on social media and make sure you subscribe and ring that bell so you never miss the show. Bye, guys.